My name is Philip Alvelda. I am the program manager Jeff was alluding to, one of the new guys in the uh, biology technology office. And I actually came to the office to work on, on this very problem, this very challenge. Uh, the idea of what comes next. What is the future of how we interface with the nervous system? And, and I came to DARPA really quite specifically because of the work that he and his team had done and all the brilliant research that flew, that, that, that grew out of that environment of imagining what's possible to help the, initially the, the, the injured warfighters, but more broadly what, what comes after. And at the time, I was building technology companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, probably the largest one was Moby TV that allowed you to watch television over your cell phones. In fact, we had a great partnership with uh, XM Sirius in the early days. So again, Martin, thanks, thanks for that too. Um, but before that, I actually worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory using artificial neural networks to solve pattern identification and target tracking and satellite navigation problems. But in the day, they, they didn't work very well. We didn't really understand what was happening at sufficient detail within the skull to really make truly powerful thinking machines. But when I saw this work, when I saw this work, I started having one of those conversations that you technologists in the audience will be familiar with. You know, you start to say things to yourself like, well, that, that, that's really quite amazing, but you know what they really need? And what I thought they really needed was, you know, now having proven these ideas, they needed someone who could take the very latest in microelectronics and the very latest photonics and engineer systems with them, start to build the next generation tools that could empower further research and broader utility. But, you know, even before or even, even beyond the, the research and the development, they also need someone who can take those technologies and figure out how to build an industry around them. And of course, I'm, I'm sharing these musings with my wife, and she's kind of shaking her head, realizing, oh my god, I know what's coming. I better check the internet and figure out which schools in DC our kids should go to. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, she realized it before I did, but ultimately, you know, I, I realized that DARPA was the place that I could have this level of impact, this level of global impact, and combine it with the experience in the agency that had gone through the process of doing exactly this sort of thing in the creation of the internet. Because I think this transition, this potential change in technology possibility is really quite profound. And of course, you know, beyond these early evolutions, DARPA has started a number of new programs to look at how to image the brain more precisely over broader areas, um, how to influence the anatomy quite directly. So there's a whole host of programs that you're gonna hear about over the next day or two uh, from program managers like Justin Sanchez and, and Doug Weber, who will go into the details of what is the new science, which are the new areas that we can begin to explore with these new technologies. But what strikes me is that, really, from a very high level, when I think of it as an engineer, the fundamental problem of empowering us to do more powerful things with the nervous system is this fundamental challenge of how do you get very, very high bandwidth, very precise information out of the incredibly complex brain on one side, which has this interesting language of electrochemical impulses, and translate it, bridge it into the language of computers that we use to manage everything else. And the complexity is staggering. Trillions of neurons and synapses on one side, trillions of transistors and wires on the other, and the remarkable thing about the early proofs of concept that we've seen so far is that they were done with 100 wires. So the remarkable progress has come despite this enormous 10 orders of magnitude bottleneck that's limiting what we can get in and out of the brain. So really, we're at the very beginning of what's possible in this industry. So let me, let me put this in context for you. If we think of how does this apply to the computing or the telecommunication revolution, I'd like you to travel back in time with me. And I've, I've chosen this example in honor of one of our other speakers, um, John Scully, the storied uh, early CEO of, of Apple. But here, you remember this?
Here we go. Do we have audio? There we go. Ah, the dial-up phone. Can anyone recognize the machine yet? That's right. It's an Apple IIe. There it is. So this was the first telecommunication, the telecommunication product in computing that had the integrated modem within the computing machine. Look at it go. <laughs> that thing operated a smoking 300 baud. That's 300 bits per second, or about 40 characters per second. You can look when he logs in, look at the speed of it. Okay, this was a wondrous product. This was the first commercial device that integrated that abstracted communication function. So in a sense, I argue that the demonstrations that we've performed so far, wondrous as they are, are the equivalent of the 300 baud modem in and out of your skull. So let's take the direct analogy of what has been done in the computer technology universe and apply it to what is now possible in biotechnology. Let me digress here and, and, and tell you that one of the great things about being a DARPA program manager is you get to meet tremendous intellects, scientists, students, engineers, technologists, innovators, really all of them. And sometimes you find one that inspires you that provides a perfect example at a presentation like this. And this happened to me a couple months ago at the optogenetics workshop in Denver, where I met a young man who was giving a poster on how do you interface with light to the auditory brainstem, exactly what I was interested in. And so I began inquiring, you know, asking details about his poster, and we had this fantastic conversation. But what was really interesting was I, I, I began to notice that this fellow was looking at me with such intense, such in, an intense gaze. And he was so directly engaged. And the next thing I noticed was that he had a very slight, almost imperceptible lisp. And it was only at that point, after talking to him for about five or six minutes in a perfectly normal exchange, that I realized he himself had two brain interfaces, cochlear implants. He was born deaf. His first implant was offered when he was three. The second one was installed more recently. But let's look at what he had installed. This is state-of-the-art commercial brain interface technology. It's from the cochlear company in Australia. And it offers a tiny little electrode you can see the coil up in the corner that has 24 contacts. It's wired to a package of titanium electron, you know, encapsulated electronics and an antenna that receives signals. And all of that is embedded in the mastoid bone completely within the skull. And then you have a hearing aid apparatus which feeds it the audio signals. But think about this. This is what is commercially state of the art and the technology was invented in 1985. So 30 years and this fellow at this conference was perfectly well able to converse with me, but he had to read my lips to do it. That's why he was staring at me so intensely. He had 24 contacts that really did a, 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 a only partial job of translating the natural world for him. Powerful, direct interface to the nervous system, but little progress in 30 years. Now, what does that mean for him? For you and I, we walk into a concert hall, we see something like this, and with normal sight and vision, we hear this. A state of the art neural interface, whether it's retinal or auditory, sounds like this. This is what the 24 contacts perform. very pale shadow of what's possible. So when you start to be motivated to invent the next technology that's going to change this, you look at the progress of neural interface bandwidth. So in the modem analogy, how many independent channels of information have we been able to pull out of the brain? How many individual neural signals could we, we resolve? Today, the revolutionizing prosthetic robot arm, about 100 contacts, 100 contacts. 
It allows us coarse movement. But now, of course, we have 30 years of microelectronics progress to apply. And even more interestingly, we now have a whole generation of new optical technologies which would promise even greater precision and greater bandwidth where we can imagine not just hundreds of interconnections from within the brain, but hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions. And this is important because with the greater bandwidth, just like today, well, we started with simple text in the 300 baud modem, and we now think nothing of firing up Netflix and getting a six megabit stream with HD video. You can imagine that with the increases in bandwidth, so increases our capability. So going from coarse motor control of a robot arm to the Luke Skywalker full interaction with touch that you'll hear about from Doug Weber, we can begin to think about parts of the brain that we might interface with that have much more complexity. And so not just controlling robot arms, but interfacing our sensory system with precision. So hundreds of thousands of connections to the auditory system, perhaps even millions of connections to the visual system. Can we get to millions? I believe we can. As Jeff said, DARPA hard for sure. But this is a benchtop instrument and work from Genalia two years ago. It's a microscope looking at the brain of a zebrafish. This zebrafish has been genetically engineered so that when the neurons fire as the fish thinks, they fluoresce, and you can capture that with video. So this is actually a video of a fish thinking, resolving each of its neurons as it fires. So how do we take that million dollar microscope that sits on a bench and turn it into something that we could put in a person? Well, the progress over the last two years has been remarkable. So this example is from Mark Schnitzer's lab at Stanford, where from the first benchtop proof of concept of this neural imaging technique, the first bench prototype on the right, not too long after that, uh, a couple of his grad students spun off a company called Inscopics, and they produce what is now the world's smallest fluorescent microscope. And within it, you can look at one of the early prototypes broken down. This was done with just a commercial grade CMOS sensor out of a webcam. Edmund Scientific Optics, a commercial grade LED. Five Nobel Prize winning labs are using that product to watch the brains of mice as they navigate mazes. Doing cognitive studies of what happens in the brain as marmosets handle objects and identify things. But this isn't quite ready for putting in a human yet. So this is where DARPA comes in. What does the next type of system replace the discrete optics with? CMOS-style color filters, just with process layers. We're taking what used to be discrete optics and miniaturizing them and planarizing them whether it's a lens lit to focus, or even in the middle, Michael Watts' work from MIT where we're making these active emitters. So not only could we sense and image what's happening in the brain, we could write to it and cause the neurons to fire. We could stimulate the brain as well. But figuring out how to image and talk to and write to the brain is only part of the problem. We also want to make it something that any of us would ultimately be interested in having implanted in our bodies. And so part of the challenge is not mi just miniaturization, but it's managing things like power and packaging and how do you take it and wrap it in a material that is hermetic and non-toxic and can be sealed to be implanted for long-term use. But having gone through some of these high-level calculations, again, with a DARPA hard program, we believe it's possible to find tidy little elements that if you want to interface to the motor cortex at extreme resolution, we can build something that you could inset in your skull. Perhaps later it could be less invasive, but initially, to be able to see clearly, we need that access. You want to look at your vision or stimulate your vision system? We believe we could put plant implants in that area. Uh, and of course, whichever part of the brain you want to be interfacing with, we believe just like the computers had a modem that abstracted that communication function, wherever you want information out of the brain, we can build a generic part that has a high precision neural interface. And within it, some common parts. 
Whatever that neural interface turns out to be, whether it's electronic contacts directly in touching the surface of the brain, passing through a ceramic coating, there's still going to be you know, the equivalent of the Bluetooth data I.O. system, the coil for receiving power, uh, the packaging and passivation that has to be sealable. Um, other variations that might be optical and imaging uh, could be built with planarized optics and, and, and work in the same fashion. But regardless, there are these common modem components that we believe it is possible to build and scale. So at DARPA, we, we talk a lot about you know, finding that point of technology leverage, of you know, not just developing something that we think would be cool, but finding what is that point that if we develop that one piece, you can create an industry. And so here, I, I, I find inspiration from this one example. This is a, an example, uh, one of the shining moments of DARPA's past. Uh, this is a napkin drawing, an image of the actual napkin that Bob Metcalf drew depicting the first ideation, the first realization that it might be possible to build a very, very high performance modem to connect different computers. So this is the precursor to what became the Ethernet modem. It's the precursor to what became 3Com. And that was the industrial moment that kicked off the exponential growth of the internet. That's what we want to build for the brain interface. We want to find our equivalent in all of its first generation ugliness with the acoustic delay line. Can you imagine an acoustic delay line and an electronic modem? But that was the first one. That was the napkin. That's what we're looking for, that point of technology leverage. And if we're successful doing that, I believe that we can go from the current state of the art, where our cochlear implant patients Instead of hearing this, where you can tell that there might be some music or rhythm, but you can't hear pitch. You can tell if you're reading lips and concentrating that someone is speaking to you and interpret what they're saying. But with a high resolution interface, with the cortical modem type of program, I believe that within five years, can you give me five? get back to this. And so quite literally, I believe that with these types of technologies, we can allow the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and the mute to speak. And beyond that, you know, Jeff, Jeff Ling has, you know, he inspired me to come to DARPA in many ways with, with his leadership. Um, and he talked about freeing the mind from the limitations of the body. But if we're successful in, in doing that with these types of technology, I think we can go another step. I think we can actually truly, truly free the mind from the limitations of even healthy bodies. And once we do that, we can go beyond just restoring lost function and imagining what are the things that we could do beyond restorative medicine. How can we extend our capabilities, extend what we see, eliminate peripheral electronics, change the communication industries, and bring about a very important change. Now, in closing, I'm going to refer to my grad school. So I, I went to grad school at MIT. Uh, some of you may know the, the, the motto of the institute, mens et manus. So it's mind and hand. And, and the theme, of course, was that you know, we engineers at MIT, we, we imagine what's possible. We apply our minds, and then we apply our hands to create them and to change the world. I think maybe we should think about what the next motto should be. Because I really do think with these types of developments, we stand on the very brink of changing our society from one that interacts with our world solely with our hands to one that can determine our fate and influence our world directly with our minds. Thank you.